Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all to Dubai and in this fifth international forum to share the knowledge and the network. It gives me great pleasure today to manage the first parallel sessions of this two days international conference focus on the project management and related topics. Today, we have privileged with the three distinguished speakers to brief us on the organization, project management, and governance models. Before I welcome the speakers to start their presentations, I would like to briefly share our experience in Dubai, a city also known as a hub for MENA region. Our city and country is blessed with a remarkable visionary leadership. There are many success, success factors in the exponential growth of Dubai. The biggest factor is the clear vision of our leader, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, ruler of Dubai and vice president of UAE. This vision led to creation of Dubai's Road and Transport Authority in November 2005, which controlled various roles that were in four different government's departments, under unified authority to manage and deliver all the roads and transport infrastructure of the Emirates. At RTE, we have practically translated the vision of our leaders into actions under the leadership of His Excellency Engineer Matar al -Tayar and through a strong team and effective organization project management that can deliver mega projects worth 100 million dirhams, 100, sorry, 100 billion dirhams, within a tight deadlines and economic challenges. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker of the day, Ms. Susan, who is an internationally recognized project leadership coach author, trainer, and consultant. <clears throat> she has over 20 years of experience working in the corporate sector, leading to high-profile programs up to $30 million for organizations such as Standard Bank, Citigroup, and JP Morgan. She is the author of the Project Management Coaching book Workbook, and the power of project leadership. She is fully qualified corporate, corporate and executive coach and NLP practitioner and DISC accredited and a regular contributor to the Association of Project Management. Suzanne is also the co-founder of the Project Leadership Institute, which is dedicated to bring authentic project leaders by engaging the heart, the soul, and the mind. Ms. Suzanne will share with us the insights from the book, The Power of the Project Leadership, how project managers can drive organization strategy by focusing on the vision, collaboration, and innovations. Please welcome Ms. Suzanne. Thank you so much for that introduction. Good morning, everybody, and welcome once again. It's a great privilege for me to speak to you today about a topic as important as project leadership, in particular how project managers can drive organization strategy by focusing on vision, collaboration, and innovation. But first, let me share with you a little bit more about myself and why I am standing here speaking to you today. I have over 20 years of experience running programs and projects, first as a consultant and later as a change manager, project manager, program manager in the financial services industry in London. But I want to take you to a time 10 years ago, because 10 years ago I realized that managing projects wasn't just about tasks and events and processes. At the time I was running the largest program for the bank where I was working. It was very stressful. The survival of our business stream, that business stream dependent on the successful delivery of this project. And I was very lucky that I attended a leadership course. And as part of that leadership course, not only were we taught about our own leadership style, I was coached for the first time. Have any of you ever been coached one-on-one? -on -one? By show of hands. If you ever get the opportunity, I would encourage you to take it. It's incredibly powerful. 
It's when somebody, it's as if somebody holds up a mirror in front of you and you see clearly what you're doing well, where you can improve. And this coaching session for me was so powerful that I felt that if I wanted to see a different result in my project and my program and my own experience, which was a very stressful one, it was entirely within my power to change it. When I say power, I don't mean executional power, I mean mental power. Sometimes we see blockages, we see barriers, oh, I'm too young to do this, or I'm too experienced, or people are more senior than me, but I really felt that I could change things. It was a question of mindset. And so the epiphany I really had was that project managers need leadership, and the whole project management profession needs leadership. Because what I saw around me was projects that were running over time, who were spending too much budget, there was inefficiencies in communication on the team, sometimes dysfunctional teams, and leadership was really one of the answers. So it changed a lot for me. It changed how I was managing and leading my projects. It also meant that I began to focus more on coaching others, coaching project managers, and in the process I wrote two books. And um, the latest, The Power of Project Leadership, is the one that I'll be sharing insights with you from today in the research that I did for this book. So that's really the backdrop. And with that, I will ask, why are we really here? And I don't mean why we're we here on this planet, because that's an entirely different question. I mean, why are we here today at this conference? And of course, you will know the answer. The answer is that we still have a long way to go. Projects continue to fail. I put there the latest statistic from the PMI. Every year they do great uh, statistics. If you haven't checked them out, PMI, the pulse of the profession, really worthwhile checking out. And they're saying that 40% of strategic initiatives are failing. We have come a long way since the Sydney Opera House failure in the 60s and the 70s. If you're not familiar with it, it's one of the biggest project management failures in history. The Sydney Opera House took three and a half times as long to implement than what was planned. It cost over 10 times as much as what was estimated. The Danish architect Utzon was kicked out of the project halfway through. So we have come a long way because back then we didn't have all of the um, processes and focuses on project management that we do today, but we still, we still see too many projects that fail. So you can ask, why is that? With all this focus on project management, how come that projects are still failing? One of the answers is that we live in a world which is increasingly complex. We see technological changes faster and faster than before. We live in an interconnected world. We work with teams across time zones, across cultures, and the competition is growing. What this means is that we can no longer have project managers or change managers, program managers, whatever you want to call us, who feel that we need to know it all and do it all. We need project managers who can innovate, who can collaborate, who can empower the team to deliver organizational change. That's not what I see around me when I coach and train project managers. That's not what I see. I don't see project leaders out there who empower teams, who innovate and collaborate. Yeah, to some extent. In the, I, I see predominantly three main mistakes. And let's see if you can recognize some of these mistakes. I see that many project managers manage tasks at the, at the expense of leading people. We need to focus on tasks, estimating effort, calculating duration, <coughs> planning, getting things done, but not at the expense of people. It is people who deliver projects, it is not processes. The second mistake I see is that we focus a lot on the urgent rather than the important. On the issues that crop up right now, on the defects, on the emails that come in, on the small fires. Yeah, firefighting has become something that most people do as a matter of course. But what about the important things? Understanding the client's business, writing the business case, building relationships with the stakeholder, 
having those difficult, challenging conversations that so many of us shy away from, sorting out the dysfunction in the team. That's the important activities that we need to attend to. And the third mistake that I see is that so many project professionals believe that they have to know it all and do it all. I often describe this as the, the pattern where project managers feel they have to rescue things. It's a superhero mentality. We parachute somebody in who can sort things out. It's a convenient idea, but it doesn't work. One of the reasons why it doesn't work is because not one person can know it all and do it all anymore. Not in this world where we have this fast technological change. So this is the backdrop, really, where we need to go and what the reality is today. As I said, we have come a long way. Things are changing, but we still need to improve. So this is the reason why I wrote the book. And in the book, I have the seven keys that can help us to step up that can help project managers who feel more empowered and empower others to deliver that which is important, to add value to the client. The first key, be authentic. It's all about being able to lead from within, to use our intuition, and also for project managers to have congruence between what we think, what we feel, what we say, and what we do. Then we are authentic. And when we lead from that place, we are much better able to inspire the team to build relationships with the client. <coughs> lead with vision, I'm going to talk more about in this presentation. It's about how project managers can step up, take part ownership for the vision and for the business case in order to deliver that which is most important for the organization or for the client. Improve and innovate, I'll also spend more time on today. This is about how, in light of the increasing competition, we need to continuously improve what we do and how we do it. Empower the team is about empowering those people who can help us deliver. Not for me as a project manager or leader to think I have all the answers, but to create a safe space for others to step in. Build trust with stakeholders. Everything is based on trust. Our stakeholders are our clients. And using powerful techniques, this is the only key in my book which is really about the tools and the techniques. But as much as project management is about leadership, we also need the basics. I am particularly fond of a technique called collaborative planning. This is where we plan, we get the post-it notes out, we plan with everybody. And what I love so much about collaborative planning in the old-fashioned way is that not only is it a great planning tool, it is a team-building tool as well. If I want my team to take ownership of what we're doing, which so many project managers complain that it's just the responsibility is on their shoulders, if we want everybody to take responsibility, we've got to shift the responsibility onto people by engaging them. And that's what we can do with collaborative planning. Work with intent, key number seven, is a bit about self-management. This is where project managers need to look at their own energy levels, their own focus, how they manage their time, so it's a comprehensive framework for project leadership. But let me focus on key number two and key number three with you here today. Lead with vision. I see a lot of project managers who are focused on the outputs, on the deliverables. This is what we're taught to do. But the organization has objectives to deliver. They have a corporate strategy. And what I'm really emphasizing and advocating is that project managers take more ownership for the vision so that we can bridge the gap, because there is sometimes a gap. Sometimes we deliver initiatives, programs, deliverables, that are not helping move the organization forward. And I will illustrate it in this way. Oops, we have some words missing from the circles. At the outer circle, we have outputs. This is where most project managers and project professionals are comfortable. But we know that the outputs only exist because we want the outcomes. Yeah, we want the efficiency gains from whatever we're delivering. And we also know that these outcomes are only interesting to us because they deliver business benefits. So the business benefits is typically what the sponsor is concerned with. 
or the executives or whoever is the client who instigates a project manager. And the project managers are comfortable delivering the outputs. But of course, we also know that the project's vision should encompass all of these things. The, the vision should encompass the project benefits, the business benefits. And it should be lined up with corporate strategy. So this is essentially the line that we need. We need congruence between all of these levels. But there are gaps. I see that there are gaps out there. And I guess I'm not the only one. So how can we bridge this gap and who's responsible for it? Who's responsible for making sure that the outputs deliver the business benefits we want and that they deliver the corporate strategy that we need? You see here, according to the PMI again, 35% of organizations don't have alignment between projects and organization strategy. This number is improving. Five years ago, it was the statistics looked worse than they do now. But again, we still have a long way to come. We all are responsible for bridging this gap. So the CEO would normally be responsible for corporate strategy, the sponsor for the business benefits, and the project manager for the outputs. But it's just not that simple. We need them all to talk together, and we need the project managers to step up and help bridge the gap by understanding the vision, by taking part ownership of the business case. I think that's the only way. If we want that to happen, we need the project managers to partner with their clients. And this is about psychology, because what I see a lot is that you have this disjoint, where we have the client here and the project manager almost submits themselves like they're a subcontractor. What this means is that I don't challenge my client, I don't really ask the difficult questions, because I see myself as less worthy. I'm just a project manager. But if we want to deliver organization strategy, if we want to empower project managers to do the right thing and to make sure that what they're delivering really adds value, we've got to have project managers to see themselves on par with the stakeholders, the clients. And what I mean there, it's just a mutual respect. I can speak to somebody who's much more senior than me, but we can still respect each other. And I can still say the things that I need to say and ask the questions I need to ask. As I said, this is all about psychology, and I think it's mostly for project managers to put worth in themselves and to not feel that they're less worthy than the senior people they're speaking to. Here are examples of some of the questions that I propose that project managers ask to help bridge the gap, to help understand the business benefits, the vision. What is it that we are ultimately trying to achieve? What is the organization trying to... What, what will this project do for the organization, the short, medium, and long term? How are we going to measure the benefits? How can we make it tangible? And a great question also for those of you in the room that are part of delivering projects. Ask yourself, would you be willing to put your own money on this? If you are willing to invest your own money in the project you're running, then I think you're on the right track. If you're not willing to, then there is probably a gap somewhere that you need to address. Now, you are well familiar with the iron triangle. Time, cost, quality, we know it well. We use it to measure the success of an output. But if we want to not just look at project management success, but look at the wider picture of success, including the vision, including what we're achieving for the organization, we've got to add some further dimensions of success. The first one being the effect on strategic projects, on strategic objectives. So, whatever you're delivering, whatever your output is, your new product, your new services, look at what the effect is on the organization's strategic objectives, whatever those objectives are. They could be tangible, intangible. And maybe you can measure them only after three years of delivering the output. Secondly, relevance to users. If what you're delivering is great, but it's not the right timing, it's not going to be adapted by people, then your project is probably not very successful, although you delivered your product or service in perfect shape. 
And the last one, very importantly, sustainability. Sustainability can mean a lot of things. It can mean whether the materials you're using are sustainable. It can mean whether your solution or product or service is durable. You see, if you implement something which you can only use for a limited amount of time, it's not very sustainable if it's just a short-term fix. I work with a senior architect firm in London, and they have a corporate social responsibility policy, as many organizations do now. And they realized that they were paying lip service to this CSR policy. They weren't actually as sustainable as they said they would be. So they have now hired an architect with the sole focus of working on sustainability and making sure that the practice uses sustainable methods, implements designs that are sustainable, and even more importantly, that it's sustainable for the people who work in the practice. So they have a very wide definition of what sustainability means. I also think sustainability is interesting because I've read that in 20, 30, 30 years time, the only companies that will be around are those that are sustainable. This is what we want more as consumers. This is what investors want. And this is what the planet needs. So my prediction is we'll see more and more projects that will be judged on their successfulness based on the sustainability aspect. But we really need all of these dimensions. We need all of these six dimensions to measure the successfulness of the project as a whole. The benefits of this are manifold. When project managers step up and lead with vision, we stop incongruent projects. We make sure that what we deliver really adds value, really helps deliver those organizational objectives. But there are other benefits too, more on the people side. When the project managers, change managers, program managers, understand organization strategy, when they understand the vision, understand why we are doing what we do, it's much easier for them to build relationships, to make joined up decisions, to inspire the team. Because you see, team members want to work on projects, and especially younger generations, they want to work on projects that have meaning and purpose. So as a project manager, I have to be able to explain to people why this project is important. Why are we doing it? It's much more about the why than about the what. Although, of course, we need both. So it can help to minimize resistance, both from within the team and from the user group that is going to adopt it. I will also say that I wrote a blog post about this, probably about three or four years ago now. And there was outrage on LinkedIn. Because how dare I say that project managers are responsible for more than delivering outputs? That is effectively what I'm saying. I'm saying that project managers must take joint responsibility for delivering the business case. For me, this is one of the ways we can plug that gap, not just sit in our little silos and say, nope, I've received a brief. This is what I'm delivering to. So let's now look at the other key I want to share with you today. Key number three, improve and innovate. As we said, there is increased competition in the marketplace. We need project managers and teams to continuously question how we can do things better, how we can improve, how we're doing work, how we can innovate the products and services that we're delivering. And I would illustrate it in this way that first of all, the first step on this journey is to understand the current state. If we want project managers to be better at innovating, they've got to understand how we do business today. What are our current processes? How do we run projects? What's happening in the marketplace? What's the current play of state? What's the current level of technology we're using? Because it's this current state that we need to question. Oh, there it comes. That we need to question and make more effective. That is essentially what innovation means, that we can improve the way we do things, the way we do business. And when I say improve and innovate, I really mean at several levels. You can improve and innovate at a product level, output level, service level, what we're delivering, but also the way we deliver things, also the way we run projects. Let's question it. So let's say the project manager, again, business acumen comes in here. Let's say they understand the business, they ask the right questions, they understand where the company is at or the client's company is at and what needs to happen, the first step. So it should be easy, right? Just go and innovate. 
But there are a number of inhibitors or blockages that we need to clear first. And there are many of them. The first one is internal to all of us. Well, not all of us, but many of us. Because most of us have been taught to comply. Yeah, this is what school is mostly all about, to put us into boxes, to make us do the assignments that we're told to do. That is everything but innovation. We don't encourage kids to question why we do things the way we do. So as people, we want to be accepted. We want to fit in. So when I say, hey, I think it's rubbish the way we do things today. Probably I shouldn't say it in that way. But some people are actually quite critical of the way we do things. But they're often not looked upon very well. Maybe they are like outliers. Maybe they're, you know, they're told that they're too critical. So we don't always encourage this thinking, this innovative thinking. And organizations, many organizations, sure, we like the new ideas. Of course, we, we want to innovate. But organizations are not willing to take the risks. Because if you want people to come up with new ideas, out of those new ideas, there will be some that are not flying. There will be some that are failing. And if we don't, as an organization, want the failures, if we're not willing to say that some of our many initiatives are not going to fly, then essentially we're also saying no to innovation, because the two go hand in hand. So Tim, Tim Hartford, the author of ADAPT, says, you know, we must learn to, um, we must learn in the experience. We must see failure just as a feedback loop. There is no failure, there's just learning. And this is part of innovation. So if we want to overcome these inhibitors, each person needs to think differently, and each organization's culture needs to think differently in terms of embracing the failure rates as well. I love this uh, quote by Seth Godin. He says, fitting in is a short-term strategy that gets you nowhere. Standing out is a long-term strategy that takes guts and produces results. If you care enough about your work to be willing to be criticized for it, then you have done a good day's work. So this really speaks to project managers and team members. Do we dare to stand out? And that's also what leadership is about, not just fitting in for the sake of it. I also want to share what um, Liz Wiseman says about this. Liz Wiseman has written a book called Multipliers. And she talks about two levels of leaders. Two, it's quite simple. The multipliers have a very positive effect on teams and on innovation. The diminishers diminish others. Diminishers are those leaders who feel they have the right answers. Hey, I'm the leader. Listen to me, I have the great answers. I'm the superhero parachuted in to sort us all out. Very convenient. But if I believe I have all the right answers, I'm not giving my team permission to really step up and say what they think and feel. Multipliers are very different. Multipliers are those people who multiply the smarts of others. How do they do that? They do that really by challenging. So they will challenge their team and say, how do we do this? This is where we need to get to. And then they step back and they create the space. They create the space for the team to step in and solve the problem. And that is quite challenging for many because as a leader, surely I'm the one who needs to show the way and who needs to come up with the good, good ideas, not necessarily. There is an overview here of what diminishers do versus what multipliers do. As you'll see on the right-hand side, multipliers coach and teach. Diminishers believe that they're the smartest person in the room with all the great ideas. And I'm sure we've all met some leaders like that. They take charge. We see them sometimes as strong leaders, but they're not having a great effect on the teams. Because if I need to meet a uh, 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 diminisher's standards, it's, again, it's diminishing me and my own ideas. We have multipliers here on the right-hand side that define the opportunity that cause people to stretch. Diminishes, they give direction. And also importantly, multipliers create a safe space. This is very important. How do they do that? This is about psychological safety. This is a word that's being used more and more frequently when we talk about high-performing teams. Psychological safety means that if I want my team to step up and innovate, 
or take, take ownership of delivering the project for a start. I need to give them permission. And I don't mean physical permission, I mean psychological permission to come forward and give me their ideas. There are introverted and extroverted people in a team. The introverted people normally don't come forward very much. I need to create a safe space where it is psychologically safe for everybody to come forward with their ideas without me as a leader criticizing them. That's what this is all about. So again, I step back, I create the space, and I say to my team, I don't have, I don't have all the right answers. What do you think? I can show vulnerability as a leader, and I can say, I have made mistakes too. I therefore give my team more psychological safety to step up and deliver without fearing that I'm going to criticize them or that they're going to lose their job if they come up with a bad idea that doesn't work. So this is very, very important. Multipliers also create a rigorous debate. They're not soft leaders. They're really challenged, but they support their team in coming up with the answers by giving people also the ownership. So you see, there's a big difference between leaders who come up with the ideas, who want to do most of the talking, and the multipliers who create the space. Questions. Again, we come to the questions. It is not so important as leaders what we know. It's important that we can ask the right questions at the right time. These are questions that stimulate innovative thinking. Questions that help us figure out what we can do better. Which bad decisions have we made that need to be reverted? What have we not yet invested in that could make a big difference? What are other teams doing that we could learn from? But, and, and you will see these are open questions, yeah? What, which, how? But there are a specific type of questions that are even better, and that's the what-if questions. What if questions really open up our minds and help to create innovative thinking? What if we could start all over? What would we do then? What if we had half the time? What would we do then? What if we knew the answer? What if we were already the best team? What would the, you know, what would the best team in the world do here? What would we do if we had no constraints? They're great, great questions. I encourage you to try them out. So in terms of um, summarizing, really, control and fear kills innovation. Trust and diversity of thought powers innovation. So in addition to being a multiplier, asking challenging questions, creating that safe space, we also need to put people together with different backgrounds. If you put people together in a room that have very similar backgrounds, they might not come up with that many different ideas. But if you put people together with very different backgrounds, who may even disagree to things, something magical could happen. You see, on many teams, we think that um, conflict is a bad thing. It's best if we all always agree. Conflict is not bad. Conflict means that we have different opinions. Let's explore those different opinions with an open mind. That's what we need when we innovate. Just look at different ideas from different angles. Some of the most innovative firms in the world employ people from various backgrounds, various schools of thought, to look at things from a completely different point of view. And then, of course, you need to create the time for innovation. Many, many organizations where I train and coach today, I see it. I see it all the time. We have tight deadlines. We are all already behind schedule. I do a lot of work in manufacturing as well. So they've already promised to the sales and marketing department that we're delivering a new product in 18 months' time. By the time we submit the plan, we're already late. Do you think that team has time to sit down and innovate with those deadlines? So we need also to create the space and the time for innovation. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening. Please talk to me today or tomorrow. Connect on LinkedIn and uh, check out my book, The Power of Project Leadership. Thank you so much.